We're 10 games into the Trail series, and with hundreds of hours of story comes a multitude of characters that we have grown attached to over the years. We've met so many individuals through our travels in Zemuria, and with the new Trails title pretty much being confirmed by Falcon for 2021, we'll likely be moving the narrative from the west to the east. And with that transition comes the potential for the appearance of old or mentioned characters. And that's what this list is, it will be comprised of characters who have either been introduced to us but we have yet to see them in game, or indeed members of older casts who have yet to make a return. As a result, this video will be filled with spoilers up to Cold Steel 4, but there will be one entry that is Hajimari related, which I will mark beforehand if you'd rather not see it. Without further ado, stick in your super rare analyzed quartz to your Arcus units, and let's go over 5 Trails characters that I want to see in the next arc. Starting at number 5, it's the first antagonist of the entire series and the one who would pave the way for the first steps of Ouroboros' grand plan, Alan Richard. Now despite having two first names as a full name, Alan! 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 Alan Richard is one of my personal favourite characters in the entire series. Even now, after all of the games I have played within and outside the Trails universe, I still feel that he has the finest redemption arc in gaming. During our journey through Sky First Chapter, Alan Richard is shown as the cunning colonel of the newly formed Laberl Intelligence Division, orchestrating several ploys to curry favour with the citizenry. In actual fact though, he was attempting to discover the secrets behind the mysterious Gospel, an artefact that he saw as a weapon that could assist Laberl in inevitable future wars. It culminates in a coup d'etat come the end of the game, where he also inadvertently releases the first seal of the fabled Liber Arc. Now there's no doubt that Alan does some pretty messed up things in the Sky First Chapter, framing the Royal Guard and even attempting to force Queen Alicia to abdicate by taking the Crown Princess hostage. But even so, I can't bring myself to hate the guy, especially when you realise why he pursues this path. Alan was a subordinate of Cassius Bright during the Hundred Days War with Erebonia, and as such he saw firsthand that the future s rank Bracer was the key reason why the war ended in LaBelle's favour. Because of Bright's ability to lead, Richard idolised the man as a paragon of Liberlian strength. So, it's a bitter pill to swallow when Cassius decides to leave the army and entrusts Richard to take up the mantle. Now despite how brilliant Richard himself is as a leader, he knew he didn't compare to Cassius, and even worse, he realised that it was only a matter of time until Liberl once again got dragged into war. His desire for the safety of his homeland and insecurity from his own ability provided an opening by which Weissman, disguised as the unassuming Professor Alba at the time, could exploit, resulting in Richard becoming more brash and forceful with his methods. By the end of Sky First Chapter, Richard realises his mistake and seeks to make amends by defeating the awakened Reverie Guardian in the sealed area beneath Grand Cell Castle. And even after his imprisonment and subsequent pardoning by Queen Alicia after his assistance in Sky Second Chapter, he refuses to forgive himself believing that nothing he does will alleviate him of his past sins. But despite shouldering a debt that in his mind he will never pay back, he will continue to act in the best interest of LaBelle, which is why he sets up the independent firm RNA Research, which has its own connections all around Zemuria. I really felt bad for Richard during my playthrough of the Sky Arc, he's a person who was desperate because of his love for his country, but despite that it took a nudge from Weissman to send him over the edge. Of course there are other characters in the series who were in a similar position of desperation to Richard, but willingly went ahead with their own grand plans. And that comparison to me demonstrates that Richard is a sympathetic individual who was pushed down the wrong path. Which I think many people can relate to when you feel so desperate that you do irrational things. His actions after the coup are a representation of the true Alan Richard. Humble, strong, respected, and a banging haircut to boot. Not to mention he obviously has ties to the Eight Leaves One Blade school through his master Cassius specialising in the morning moon form. And if you don't know me too well, the Eight Leaves is my favourite sword school that has thus been revealed to us in the series. Mine hoping for Alan's return though is more a wish than a nailed on occurrence, I can't see a reason narratively why his return would be justified. But even a small cameo from the man would be much appreciated. Moving on to my only Hajimari-inspired ranking, it's the enigmatic character known only as Hime, or Princess in English. 
She appears during one of the final episodes given to the player after the events of Hajimari no Kaseki named Another Hot Spring Town Beyond the Genesis. The setting is Long Lai City, which is described as an area that acts as the pathway to the easternmost part of the Republic, which already raises my interest as it suggests there are other lands to the east of Calvert. The Schwarzer family are on a hot spring holiday at the beginning of 1208 of the Septian calendar, where Reen, being Reen, decides he has another reason to accompany his family outside of soaking away with Daddy Teo, and that motive lies in finding his master. Upon journeying to the mountains to begin searching, he comes under attack by the mysterious Ikaruga, a group of eastern mercenaries who are basically Trail's ninja. Naturally, being a Divine Blade at this point, only the leader of this band are able to take on Reen in one-on-one -on -one combat, with the opponent, Kuragane, praising Reen's ability but stating that he doesn't compare to their princess. No sooner has curiosity been piqued, does a voice ring out to end the fight. Xeroth form Twin Shadows As written by Falcom and translated by the team at Zerofield, this is how the princess is described to us. She was adorned with a combat suit that seemed a mix of traditional Eastern style garb and cutting edge technology. Her flowing silver hair radiated, beautiful as the moonlight it reflected. She seemed around Reen's age, perhaps even a bit younger. Her face had delicate, innocent features, yet her eyes betrayed a look as cold and heartless as a bottomless pit. Her appearance could be taken for that of a well-bred young lady or a heartless warrior who'd stained her hands with blood countless times. One couldn't be sure which of these two conflicting ideas was right, but their simultaneous presence lended to that feeling. In her left hand she gripped a jet black Odachi, no doubt the same one that had cleaved the sky just moments ago. This description alone has made me so excited for this character. Yes, we've only seen a silhouette, but based on this episode, the princess is not only a divine blade herself, or at least on equal footing with one, but she also has ties to another school called the Black God One Blade School. Not only that, I get the impression she's like a more playful Aryan road. She has that foreboding aura that surrounds her character, but she's still oddly regal despite that. Not to mention her Odachi or Treasure Sword intrigues me as well. For those who are not too familiar, an Odachi is basically a katana which was traditionally used for cavalry units, or to indeed cleave down cavalry. In other words, it's a big f***ing sword and she wields it in such a way that she snapped Reen's Tachi in two, even with him using his lucid spirit unification technique. She disappears shortly after this, but there's no doubt that those sprinkling of lines have drawn me into this character. For her connection to the Eight Leaves, her supposed relationship with the Master of the School, and her perceived importance in the next arc, I can't wait to see what she will be bringing to the table. Number 3 goes to the Grand Master of the Grolls Ritter, and as her name suggests, the first of the Dominion, Ein Selnut. Now unlike the previous entry, Ayn has been showed in game, we get a brief glimpse of her at the end of Sky the Third aboard her Macabre. Outside of that though, we've only seen her in various flashbacks, again limited to Sky the Third. A lot of the story we know about Ayn is confined to additional literature within and outside the games. Carnelia, which is the first novel we can collect in the series and is also the alias by which she goes by, details a fair chunk of backstory on her. And despite being embellished, because of course Ayn is not dead as the novel suggests, it gives you an idea of what she could be capable of, not to mention giving information as to why she and Tovar share a connection of sorts. And then we have also seen her in Ring of Judgment, as she requested Tovar along with Estelle and Joshua to retrieve an artifact so that she could confiscate it for the church soon after. It's because of Ayn that the Bracer duo eventually make their way to Crossbell in their search for Ren. Now of course, Ayn is a puzzling character into herself, we know very little about her, and it seems that uncertainty extends to the characters of Trails as well. A fair few know about her, but that's about as far as their knowledge goes. But we can assume a few things. She is the head of the Dominion and the strongest among their ranks, which suggests that she is one of the strongest characters in the series. Tovar even said that he holds her at the same level as the likes of Aurelia and Victor Arsade. We also know that she is committed to the mission of the Church, that being the sealing of artifacts, and considering that the Church is going to be taking on a more prevalent role in the final third of the series, I think that it's only a matter of time before Ayn makes an appearance of some sort. From what I've read about her, she seems to have a tapes no sh** attitude kind of like Aurelia. She's not afraid to lay down the gauntlet when she needs to either. Because of her supposed strength and her ties to Arteria, this is a character that I'm very much looking forward to seeing, and unlike Alan Richard, I think there's a good chance she'll make her appearance soon.
At number two, it's another member of the church, the certified onion bro and Fifth Dominion Kevin Graham. Now, Kevin is a character that many players will be familiar with. He even became a protagonist in the final game of the Sky Arc, and it's fair to say that he is one of the fandom's favourites. That feeling extends to myself as well. I love Kevin and his journey of self-realisation in Sky the Third, not to mention his swift decimation of Weissman at the end of Sky's second chapter, which still stands as one of my top moments in the series. Initially, what drew me to Kevin is the polarity of his character. For the majority of second chapter, he is seen as a jovial wandering priest who helps out with Sunday school, but occasionally offers his aid and a shoulder to cry on when needed. That lends superbly to the final events of the Liber arc, where his cold and emotionless dispatch of Weissman shows the true Kevin Graham beneath the mask. An icy-veined and ruthless assassin who will take down any heretic on his radar. And it provides the perfect platform for him to take the mantle in the final Sky game. I adore the main story of Sky the Third because it shows how messed up Kevin really is. He's not psychologically insane or anything, he's just full of self-loathing, because he feels his actions led to the deaths of two people most dear to him. His frail mother killed herself after giving up hope on raising him alone, and Rufina sacrificed herself to save Kevin when his stigma went out of control. And Kevin, being inherently empathetic, felt that he was to blame for these events. But despite his perceived sins, the Church seemingly rewarded him for Rufina's death by granting him the title of Fifth Dominion. And it's because of this sick irony that Kevin looks for the most brutal missions, not because he wants to rid the world of heretics, but because he wants to rid the world of himself. What follows is a gripping journey of forgiving oneself and finding true closure to something that has haunted Kevin for near on his whole life. Accepting that the deaths of those closest to him were not his fault, and realising that, taking up the ideal laid down by Rufina. This journey allows him to push on with Rias by his side as the renamed Fifth Dominion, the Thousand Hands. This small excerpt of Kevin's struggle doesn't do him justice at all. It's one of those special character arcs in the series, and I was buzzing when I got to see him once again in Aono Kaseki, straight up taking on an Ion in one-on-one -on -one combat. With the aid of his ship, I guess. But because I think the guy is so damn awesome, and because of his ties with the church, I am pleading for him to return. And again, like Ayn, I feel that due to the rising importance of the church in the future of the series, it's safe to assume that his return is likely close at hand. Just don't bait me, Falcom, you've done it before. At the pinnacle of my most anticipated characters list, it's the Sword Hermit and founder of the Eight Leaves, Yoon Kafai. Now Yoon, like a couple on this list, is a character we know very little about. We've never actually seen him in game, though we at least have some sprite art to work with. Rather, what makes Yoon so captivating as a character is the mystery surrounding him. Many characters in the series are aware of Yoon, who himself being a hermit travels all over the continent, bringing the influence of the East with him, not to mention his unique school of swordsmanship. We've heard about Yoon as early as the Sky Arc, as he is of course the master to Cassius Bright and the grandfather of a fan favourite in Annalais Elfied. But his character gained even more traction come Cold Steel, as he again takes the role of master to the main character of the arc. We see his influence in various moments, providing a guiding hand to Reen, especially when he feels lost. A couple of select moments come to mind immediately. He's not someone you could call a strict teacher, but he puts a large amount of responsibility on his students. Him cutting Reen's training short in Cold Steel 1 is a good example. The man is also wise, as he seems to press the right buttons at just the right times as well, a hallmark of a knowledgeable master. And despite being away from Reen, you can tell that the heir to the Schwarzer Barony has a massive amount of respect for Yoon and his teachings. That respect extends to some of the strongest individuals in the series. Despite Yoon's age, which has vaguely been confirmed to be around 70, he is able to stand on equal footing with Victor S. Arce at the very least, and we know that other individuals in the same bracket of strength have either fought him or intend to duel him should they meet. But from the letters we read from Yoon and the brief descriptions of his visits to places like Amir, we start to build this idea of who he is in our minds, a respected and approachable master, but also a journeyed old man who sees the beauty in the world around them a man who shares his own culture and provides a small glimpse to the identity of Eastern Sumeria. You could potentially say he's like an unofficial ambassador. And it's because of all of these traits that I find myself drawn to Yoon. I'm a huge fan of the carefree yet sagacious characters, and I feel he encompasses that. One of the final episodes from Hajimari has reignited my curiosity, and now that the Calvert arc is pretty much on our doorstep, I feel that now is the time when we will finally see this lauded character in the flesh. 
And there it is guys, my top 5 anticipated characters for the future of the series. I'm hoping that my explanations of why I want to see them in the future gives you an idea of what I personally find so engrossing about this series in the first place. The mystery, the continuity, or just the well-written nature of the characters have always been substantial draws of the Trails universe, and I feel that each character on this list demonstrates one or several of those traits. Hopefully come the next arc we'll see these characters make their grand appearances. Until next time guys, peace.